Our final speaker this morning, before a time <clears throat> for some Q&A, is a name that I'm sure is familiar and a voice that I'm sure is fam familiar to many of you. Charles Goyette is not only a longtime radio host in the Phoenix area on several stations, he's also someone who's done so much to forward and assist the Ron Paul revolution by working with Ron uh, on his radio podcast. And finally, I will, only, I will just note that uh, Charles should be lauded by everyone in this room for having the courage to stand up against the foreign policy disaster and mis misadventure known as the Iraq War at personal cost to himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Goyette. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many friends and, and friends of liberty in one place. Dangerous to be in one place. There aren't enough of us, but... Uh, uh, and it's always an honor for me to get an opportunity to participate in anything that the Mises Institute does, because I consider it, and I'm sure you'll agree, that it is the vital and intellectual center of the freedom movement in America today. And it's an honor, it's a real honor for all of us to think and be able to tell our kids and our grandkids in the future that we had a chance to hear from and break bread with the two most effective champions of liberty of our era, Lou Rockwell and Ron Paul today. <laughs> so the question before the house is what is to be done? It's actually a question that has a very old pedigree. Lenin addressed it. Murray Rothbard addressed it. Um, we've in the meantime had a lot of Lenin, very little, uh, very little of Rothbard about what is to be done. So as I pondered how to get into the topic this morning, the, uh, the Arizona Republic landed on my doorstep with the answer yesterday morning. <laughs> and the answer was this, a story here on the front page that says uh, the United States spent $384 million to train 180 Syrians. <coughs> now, it notes in the lead, that's $2 million a piece, of course to train them. Now it notes in the lead so that uh, you won't be alarmed, it says these are the moderate Syrians. <laughs> Just like the other ones that we, all the moderate, they're all moderates when we, when we train them. And, uh, and then it notes, it assures us by the way that although this might seem like an exorbitant amount of money, uh, that it's not all money down the drain because they didn't spend it all, a whole bunch of it is still sitting in, uh, in warehouses in the form of weapons, equipment, and ammunition in Syria. Oh, great. <laughs> you, know, you know how that will be used, don't you? So the state engages, though, in violence and economic waste like this, like a, like a meth addict. Um, and when you ask what is to be done, it seems to me clearly there is only one answer, and we must hasten to disempower the state by any means possible um, before they engage in any more ruin and any more, uh, any more violence. And I will frame this with two examples of the, uh, the presidents of this new millennium. Uh, one example from each of them dealing with both violence and uh, uh, fiscal madness. And let me start with George W. Bush just a couple of weeks before he launched his, uh, his war in Iraq. The president met in the White House with a couple of uh, Iraqi American businessmen to discuss what is to be done in Iraq after Saddam Hussein is gone? And so help me. Now, I, this isn't an internet rumor. I have this from a U.S. ambassador in his book. The conversation went something like this. The president said, Sunnis? Shia? I thought Iraqis were Muslims. <laughs> And, and of course, this is the uh, the intellectual enlightenment that led to you know taking the uh, letting the genie out of the bottle in the Middle East and the you know the increased polarization and radicalization of the region and the uh, the, the destruction and the deaths and and uh, you know the migration now throughout Europe and the threat to Western civilization over the next hundred years and all of this stuff. I thought they were all well. I thought they were all Muslims. So, but to be nonpartisan, I don't like to say bipartisan, but nonpartisan, let me tell you about the last presidential election. Barack Obama showed up on David Letterman's show. 
And David Letterman happened to ask early in the uh, conversation, he said, so how much is the national debt? Oh, you've never seen Obama so nervous. Because <laughs> clearly he had no idea. <laughs> now, I mean, this is absolutely astonishing, you know, for somebody that's opining and talking about whether the debt limit should be raised, how much we spend, it's like, no idea. And so he kind of, you know, and, and, and so Letterman came to his rescue and he said, he, Obama said, well, I don't know precisely. So Letterman said, well, is it $10 trillion? Now, for the record, the national jet debt had just climbed to $10 trillion at about the time Barack Obama was elected. At the time he showed up on Letterman's show, it was $16 trillion. You know it's about 18 and a half now, and it'll be $20 trillion when Obama leaves office. So Obama's very wily, and he said, he said, well, in, in, in ducking the question, he said, well, the thing you have to know about the national debt is we owe it to ourselves. <laughs> Now, I was a little shocked to hear this because I heard this all in my public education in college. I heard this Keynesian nonsense all my formative years. But I thought they had stopped it because, you know, even if you could say it back then, you can't say it now. You know, we owe, we owe, over, six, we owe over $6 trillion. With all deference to Lou, let me put it a little better. He reminded us the other day. The government owes over $6 trillion dollars to foreign. I, I'm not a part of it. Leave me out of this. <laughs> the, the government owes over $6 trillion to foreigners. So you can't, uh, $2.5 trillion to the Chinese and the Japanese. So you cannot say that, uh, you know, we owe, we owe it to ourselves. But listen, I was always on the alert for this kind of balderdash in, uh, from my teachers and so on. And I got a lot of it in, in my formative years, you know, a child of the 50s and 60s. Um, and I suppose one of the reasons I got, uh, I got wary about the things that they would say was in the first grade, interested in things about government politics and stuff. And I remember asking my first grade teacher to explain to me the difference between a king and a president. Now, I'd be generous and say that I'm sure that she was trying to, you know, to address my little five or six year old consciousness and teach me something about democracy. So she said, so help me. Well, the people don't necessarily want the king, but they want the president. Oh, uh, man, you haven't been around my house long. You should hear my dad. <laughs> so I, so I, I feel like I was uh, somewhat uh, immunized against a lot of this, this uh, conventional wisdom stuff went on, but there was one, I will confess to you, that bothered me a great deal in high school and into college, when you would talk about, uh, you talk about the regulatory state, the imposition of the state, when you talk about uh, centralized economic planning, when you would talk about um, free markets. And this was a, was a meme that was repeated over and over again. It was, well, Charles, all of that stuff, you know, that might have been, that might have been fine for simpler times. Oh, that, that was okay for, you know, at the time of the founders and so on. But this is, a, you know, this is hopelessly outdated. Oh, that stuff was, was okay in a simple agrarian economy, but, you know, things are far too complex and we're far too large for any of this kind of uh, freedom stuff. And, you know, it's an assertion. I mean, I, you can deal with somebody who says we owe it to ourselves, and you can point out how absurd that is. But when somebody makes an assertion like this, you know, it's, there's nothing really to grab on. It's just assertion, oh, it's not appropriate for our complex era. And it bothered me a lot, not, not because I thought it was true, but I didn't really know how to refute it. And the problem with something like that, of course, is that taken to its logical extreme, you know, with increasing complexity, with uh, increasing growth, if it mandates more and more state uh, intervention in our lives, you know, the end game is obviously totalitarianism, which is clearly where we were all, all headed. So I embarked in a media career uh, when I was still a teenager. And this put me in the company of people with life accomplishments that were well above my pay grade. You know, authors and opinion mongers and uh, people of kind of worldly accomplishment. And, and when I would find one who I thought was, you know, friendly to our ideas about, uh, about, about freedom, about liberty, about markets and so on and so forth, I would start to inquire of them, you know, well, what do you say about this? 
Now, I will tell you, nobody ever could give me an answer. I never got a satisfactory answer. I got a certain, oh, it, no, it's still, it's fine, everything, no, oh, they're, they're wrong. So, but I wanted an answer. I wanted something that I could hang my hat on. And I did not get one. Now, eventually, I discovered Austrian economics. Thank goodness. And I discovered Mises and uh, discovered Rothbard and discovered Hazlitt and I discovered the whole cor corpus, the whole body of, uh, of Austrian economics. And so it was all, suddenly it was like, uh, you know, it was like mana from heaven. It was like an intellectual feast for me that we, you know, I now had a means of refuting things that, that I knew wasn't true, but that I couldn't refute as an adolescent. And so, and I, I wonder to this day how any self-respecting or intellectually honest, if there is one socialist, can have a frankly confronted Mises' critique of uh, socialism and its inevitable failure, it can't calculate, how they can have encountered this and not jumped out the window. Um, I, I, apparently it hasn't gotten to Bernie Sanders yet. <laughs> you, oh, I just learned, you probably all know this, I just learned Bernie Sanders took his honeymoon in the Soviet Union. <laughs> now that's, you know, now I, I mean, if you want to show solidarity with, uh, you know, with the socialist classes, you could have gone to, you know, Italy or France and had something a little more romantic, but he went to, he went to the Soviet Union. In any event, it may not have been known, and it hasn't been learned yet, uh, by Bernie Sanders, but they knew it in the Kremlin. And that's why they had the Sears catalog this poor, pathetic effort to, uh, to impute the prices and the relative value of things in the absence of a price system, and they used, they turned to the American Sears catalog to try to fake it. So, Austrian business cycle theory. How can anybody be fooled? How can anybody be taken in? How can anybody uh, accept, you know, QE1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever they've got planned for us, however far. Fed manipulation of interest rates without seeing the hard reckoning <laughs> that all of this stuff means, as though there's magic money. You know, we can magic, magically create it and it has no impact. We just get, there's no cost to doing so. And, but, you know, we don't believe in magic because we're adults. So, and it's the same, it's, it's the same with, uh, in my view, uh, a uh, Hayek's distinction between what he called a taxis and a cosmos, and how anybody can have confronted that idea and still supported central plan. A taxis was, you know, was a structure, a, a top-down, organized thing. You know, we get the word taxonomy from it, right? Um, we we have a taxon in the animal kingdom. You know, it's everything classified. You know. Uh, uh, we have chordata, and we have you know kingdom, family, class, order, family, genus, species. So the duck-billed platypus comes along, kind of screws the structure up a little bit, but you know it it has it has its place, and a, a cosmos is a spontaneously arising, an autodynamic, a self-generating system. And Hayek likes to talk about language. It's a great example of a cosmos, the self-generating. Nobody nobody handed it down. Nobody created it. It didn't come from a committee or the state. But it's not just language. It's, uh, it's the evolution of money. And uh, markets, of course, are great examples of, of this sort of stuff. When Donald Trump builds a high rise, he appropriately uses uh, the, the taxis model. I mean, you know, so many, so many uh, spans of steel of such and such structural strength, so many, you know, uh, miles of copper wiring for this, so much this, so much that. You know, it's all, and it's all, it all has to be very, very precise, and that's the appropriate application of the taxis model. But were he to succeed in the same kind of structure, you know, forcing the top-down order on uh, the economy, on trade, on all the things that he's going to force it on, you know, we, the, the obvious result would be a calamity. And of course, we have all the evidence in the world of this. And I don't understand why it's so often overlooked. You know, you have the, the failure of the Soviet Union. You have uh, East Germany and West Germany. You have North Korea and South Korea. You have ample evidence of this kind of thing. When, when a president, say Bush, decides to impose an order like a Jeffersonian democracy on Iraq, a calamity is going to resort, is going to, is going to be the result. Because if, if, 
you understand the centralization and command nature of this structure, you understand that it destroys culture, it destroys spontaneous order that uh, people have created in their own lives over time with things that have worked, it destroys uh, what we call a, then a, a cosmos. So this is how I began to immunize, immunize myself against uh, the, the uh, central economic planners of the state and uh, the global empire builders and, and so on. Now, rather than their assertion, this is evident to all of you already, the, rather than the assertion of my teachers that, you know, the more complex, the argument of complexity and size and so on, uh, makes, you know, the cosmos model or the freedom model, the market model inappropriate, the truth is just the opposite. The more complex, the larger, the more imperative the market is. I mean, you can imagine, I guess, a, you know, a closed economy, an island, you know, state of one guy that makes bread and one guy that fishes, and the chieftain tells him what to exchange things at and so on, and he rakes off his take, and then he tells him what to exchange it for. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, maybe they could get fed. Maybe that would work, but everything changes. In the real world, everything changes. You know, somebody, you know, oceans change, uh, the fishing patterns change, crops fail, somebody dies. Somebody's born, a castaway washes ashore, whatever, whatever it is. But if you multiply those few actors by, by hundreds of millions, you begin to be staggered by the complexity of it all. And yet it all solves itself organically without a, a central command. In New York City, it's estimated that there are something like tens of billions of SKUs. These are stock keeping, stock keeping units for products and tens of billions for products and, and services, and all, only a madman would think himself capable of intervening in this process. Well, this is something I wrote about in, uh, in Red and Blue and, and Broke All Over. Um, but I do want to say that when I suggest that being immunized against the plague of statism, uh, we can depend upon Austrian economics, I, I do want to suggest that I mean only people with healthy human consciousness. Now, that means not politicians, <laughs> with the obvious exception of, uh, of, of one, but anybody eager to control, anybody ambitious to, uh, to rule others, any, anybody that is uh, hungry, the native criminal class, um, don't have what I like to call healthy human consciousness. In in uh, early World War II, Richard Nixon worked in the office of Price Administration in Washington, D.C. These were the price control guys. He worked in tires. These were the rationing guys, the price control guys. And, and uh, he learned what a nightmare this stuff was. But the White House tapes show us that when he introduced his Leninist-sounding new economic plan in <clears throat> August of 1971, and phase one, phase two, phase three of Richard Nixon's price controls, he knew that it would be destructive to the economy and he imposed it anyway, why? Because it would be good for his reelection chances he surmised in 1972. Not healthy human consciousness. The, the very existence of these people though and their hunger for, for, uh, for power, desire to rule, to control and so on, is as great an argument as any that uh, the state needs to be disempowered and it needs to be disempowered right away. So what is to be done? When Murray Rothbard addressed this question more than 50 years ago about the freedom movement, about the liberty movement, about liber libertarians, he said, he said, well, what we really are gonna need is a center of gravity. We're gonna need a hardcore center. We're gonna need a, 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 a center that we can all kind of be around, you know, to hold us uh, together and, and so on. And, and uh, we have such a center. We have one of demonstrable capability, of great achievement, the kind that uh, Rothbard was talking about 52 years ago or so when he wrote What is to be Done. I, and I began by saying, calling him out. I, I said, you know, that the Mises Institute is the, is the vital and the intellectual center of the freedom movement in America today. I, I shudder to think where the freedom movement would be without it. So I will tell you from my, my lifetime and trying to bring people in, trying to recruit people, talking about freedom in the media and my personal life and, 
and so on in the public debate, I have found that the single most effective way to immunize people against the blandishments and the lies and the, the uh, conventional wisdom and the, the naked assertions of the state and the status, the most effective way to immunize people against the state and its de desire for ever more violence and uh, economic destruction is, is Austrian economics. So there is a great deal to be done, but so much has been, been done for us. There are so many resources available to us thanks to the Mises Institute. Uh, and we must all help, I believe, in every way that we can. Thank you very much.